In this video, I will be having a chat with Dr. Edward Lichten to discuss how low-dose anabolic steroids can be used to treat inflammation, thereby treating and potentially even curing many different forms of disease, as well as using these same anabolic steroids to significantly improve insulin resistance in order to treat and potentially cure diabetes, and finally discussing his honeymoon cream, which can send a woman's libido into the stratosphere. Hey guys, welcome back to the Danny Bossa podcast. Joined with me today, Dr. Ed Lichten. How are you doing, Ed? Doing really well, considering everything. Considering everything, yeah. It's been quite some time since we've spoke, for sure, and you've got uh, quite a few things that have gone on in your life since then. You want to give the viewers a little background uh, who aren't already familiar with your work? All right, well, I, um, I've been an OBGYN for 50 years, trained it with the top OBGYN in the country. I declined the cancer fellowship at uh, at Sloan Kettering because I didn't believe they knew what they were doing about cancer. Been in private practice, and the last 35 years, I've specialized in looking at sex hormone binding globulin, which is the hormone that modulates testosterone, actually to the point where 80% of my patients are men. Uh, in the last few years, with some collaboration with um, Manuela Newman, who's head of a I intravenous, excuse me, in vitro cytokine laboratory in Toronto, and she's editor of two GI journals. We've gone into the looking at what causes inflammation and why are we able to use anabolic steroids to treat inflammation? Because when I go to the Crohn's meeting, I say, look, look at all these patients that failed with Humira and failed with these other drugs, and look, how well they're doing on anabolic steroids, and they look at me like, so what? And uh, one chairman actually says, I'd rather just send them to the surgery than try your antibiotic steroid. So the internist point of view, like everything else, I have to say, unfortunately, is not necessarily patient-directed, but can be business-directed. And now yeah. we have a laboratory testing that actually um, they can't disprove. Uh, some of the other research that um, we'll mention briefly is uh, I have discovered a, a treatment that actually can raise oxytocin centrally in the brain. It's never been done before. And uh, uh, one of the interesting side effects of using anabolic steroids that I've been pushing first at the A4M in 1999 is we can show how to add anabolic steroids and eliminate insulin dependence from men whose hemoglobin A1Cs were as high as 18. I'm not promising that, but I have a few who've lost 70, 80 pounds on the anabolic steroids, and they do not use insulin at all. So that's a wow. little, little gist. Okay, so let's start. You, you were mentioning um, you got a lab going on in Toronto to measure cytokines. Now, you, you want to just kind of dumb down the, 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 what, what cytokines are for those. Um, there's a lot of people that have heard of cytokines. Um, especially during the, the last two years, there was a lot of talk about COVID and cytokine storms and the effects of the bias. So the word cytokines has kind of come up. Um, you know, the, the word is becoming more and more popular in social media. People are kind of learning what it is. But do you want to just kind of dumb down exactly what cytokines sure. are and what it is you're measuring? When, when you look at COVID, the COVID virus infects the lung. So the body, you know, they keep talking about innate immunity and adaptive immunity. Innate immunity is if you had a vaccine, like a vaccine against smallpox, okay? Now, I wrote this actually two years ago and talked to infectious disease man at Mayo, completely ignored me. But the idea of vaccinating against a virus that changes all the time is about as effective as uh, vaccinating against a cold. So you have an innate immunity is if you had immunity from some previous infection or similar infection, uh, but this virus never appeared until 2019. So when your body finds something new, it's called adaptive immunity. The body adapts to the infection, viral, bacterial, cancer, whatever, by setting out different parts of the immune system. One part, the major part, is called the T lymphocyte. And the T lymphocyte gets out there and it has 
what are called cytokines. So you've sent the platoon in, the T lymphocytes, and now they're going to take pieces of that, different organelles, we can call it, to affect different things. So if you watch TV, you see Humira, they're treating tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is eat it and destroy it. A very common one, you may see VEGF, which is the one that increases vascularity. So your white cells could get into that infected area, um, but also works in reverse. It gets cancer to promote. So this is typical 1B, uh, 4, 6 is a big one as, as, as a center in you know, the leader of the platoon, and then 8 and 10, VGF and t tumor necrosis factor. And actually, the body also makes one called IL-2, which is an anti-inflammatory. The trouble with COVID is because of the spike protein that does not exist in nature, is that the spike protein confuses the immune system and it gives these, um, this, we call it rear guard attack, because here you're facing, on one hand, you're facing the virus in the lung. On the other hand, you're facing these cytokines going crazy in the background. And what happens is the spike protein screws up the immune system and it really doesn't have a major way of shutting off cytokines. So uh, what happens in this case is the cytokines start proliferating and running, driving themselves on cytokine release syndrome and cytokine storm where they're just rampaging until a person dies. So one area of research also has been, how can you shut off the cytokines? So any drug companies listening, the article is going to be coming out hopefully first part of the year, we figured out how to shut off the cytokines. I know it's going to work for COVID, but it works for all the other infectious diseases, Crohn's, diabetes. We can show that we actually can get to the right receptor on the nucleus, a hormonal receptor, and we can actually turn down the release of the cytokines. And if you see the word stop signal or stop signaling, signaling from this hormonal receptor keeps the pro-inflammatory cytokines from, from attacking. But if you look at Humira, they're just destroying the TNF-alpha. They are not looking at the natural process that continues. And this is why drugs like Humira will have resistance, it, they say as high as 50% at two years. So the idea oh. that cytokine is a rear guard that came because of the reaction to the COVID, and that cytokine is the cause of death three to four times more often than, than the pneumonia. Uncontrolled. So stop, the, stop the cytokines and you're stopping the, 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 the big chunk if, of the damage can, that it's causing but, to begin with. But, but every disease that has inflammation, so I can show I can stop the cytokines on endometriosis. We have an IRB at a university. Um, diabetes, we'll talk a little bit about that. The Crohn's, um, I'm getting two-thirds of the patients that fail with everything, including surgery, back home. So if we're addressing inflammation, you know, if you walk to my office and say, Doc, you know, check me out. I said, well, let me measure your cytokines. And if all your cytokines are normal, you're good. But even breast cancer, we find positive cytokines. And whatever it is, if you can turn off the cytokines, you're turning off inflammation. And life becomes almost that simple. So this becomes, a, is this just simply a blood draw? It's is a blood this... draw. It's expensive because it's a lot of hand-holding. Okay. I mean, she cultures the T lymphocytes in a certain way. Uh, there's special ELISA testing for every one of those six or eight or ten cytokines. Then it's a knowledge base that I build up by treating 15 or 20 patients and observing them. So uh, it's expensive, but, uh, you know, like you asked for me, yeah, I've had it. One I had four years ago, I looked like an 18-year-old. And now with um, Guillain-Barre, which every doctor doesn't know shit about, um, my inflammatory scores are double what everybody else is, even the worst Crohn's patient and I can't turn them off now. And there are some patients who broke through. I had a patient with pancreatic cancer. Everything was normalized as much as I could do, but he still died. But still, if we can say two out of three patients coming in with a, quote, I hate to say routine inflammation, we can make their life better. I mean, I think that's, you know, holy shit. You know? Yeah. And that's what so we're you're doing a blood draw. You're measuring the cytokines. The and blood then is you're drawn, essentially. Yeah. And sent to the lab. 
where she cultures the T, T lymphocytes, so it's all she has. Then we put them in aliquots, okay, put a little bit, we get a measurement for what every one of those cytokines were. Then we put them in aliquots, and if I'm talking about Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, which I am focusing on right now, I'll have uh, Humira, uh, Zyposia, uh, Infliximax, three or four of the biologics, and then I'll have the anabolic steroids. The two you can't get, Nandrolone and Stanazolol, are the most potent than testosterone. But like in an endometriosis study, we wouldn't have the testosterone group. And then we have DHEA and Danacrine. Uh, so we have only five or six anabolic steroids. And sometimes oxandrolone, which is man-made, will be positive. But most often, when you mix these in, the natural hormones are not cellular destructive. But the man-made hormones, the body can't handle them. And we find is that... Is androlone and stenazolol considered a, a natural I, I'm hormone? telling you, based on testing, they act like natural. Okay. Okay. Oxandrolone, um, once in, I, some patients just can't take it because uh, it shows a cellular toxicity. If I put Humira in there, uh, they have the best kill rate on TNF-alpha, but after two years, they're so inflammatory to the cell that it's destroying cells. So we have five different ways we can look at how, how does that drug affect the cell, okay? Is it, is, there's a test called lymphocyte toxicity assay. Uh, they, she can measure whether it helps proliferate, uh, make the more cells grow, um, uh, and, and she can look at the cells themselves under the microscope. And, you know, like we used to look at it under a microscope for red blood cells to look at things. She can look at the lymphocytes as well. So we have a whole handful of ways of looking. Is this drug safe for you? And okay. I, I tell you, natural hormones. That we talk about testosterone, androlone, sinazolol, danacrim, no problem. We, you know, some are preferred. One patient does better with one drug or the other. But we're creating that term called specificity and personal medicine. We don't need a half a billion dollar study or 1.5 on Humira because what worked for everybody else doesn't necessarily work for you. Here right. you got one test for one person using your body cells. I mean, this is cutting edge. I mean, this is 20 years of ed, anything but anybody's thinking about. And we've used to even look at patients with breast cancer. I don't know how far it'll go, but it's a new door. So you're essentially doing a blood draw of the patient, bringing it to a lab, analyzing the cytokines, applying different types of anabolics to these cytokines to see which ones will basically deactivate them, if you will. And when you find the one that does, you know that if you administer the drug or the, the, the hormone, if you will, to the patient, it will basically deactivate these cytokines, reduce inflammation, and potentially reduce or potentially even eliminate or cure the disease itself. Is that, it is, is that yeah, exactly, more or less what you're saying? For first time hearing it, you, you hit it right in the nose. So in vitro testing gives us in vivo answers. So um, I'm... I have people who test well, but not everybody responds. So I said six out of eight of the patients with severe Crohn's where they had failed three drugs or had, had surgery, we got responses. Um, six out of eight, two we got, no, one got no response, one we got a little bit of response. But if we find, because we're going to talk about biological hormones and natural hormones, if we find that we get and I know people are familiar with the test called BioT. The bioavailable testosterone is testosterone divided by sex hormone binding globulin. Normal range officially in 1972 was from 100 to 400 percent. Those people who go up to towards that 400 percent ratio, I can push them to them. I have one patient uh, with short bowel syndrome on intravenous feeding, went back. Guys, masters is teaching full time. Bioavailable the, being the amount of testosterone that is bound to SHBG but not yeah. bound to albumin, correct? Right, and at that ratio, okay. you know, if you get one kid, I can only get him to eighty-five percent. He's back at school. We picked him up at eighteen. I've treated him for six years, but he's going to have more problems than the one who can go to three or four fold. So, if your body really absorbs 
accepts the testosterone without side effects. Um, I'm saying three of those patients were so sick, you know, basically pre-death, and then they are living perfectly normal lives. So it's to me, it's amazing. So you're the first person that I've heard uh, refer to uh, compounds such as nandrolone and stanozolol as natural hormones. My understanding was always that they were synthetic derivatives of natural hormones. Can you just elaborate yeah. on that a little bit? Yeah, the body makes testosterone. But if you want to look at part, because we're going to talk about diabetes in a little bit, anybody who's listening, write down N-I-F-T. That stands non-insulin facilitative transport. Good article by Hobbs out of the Sheffield Hugh Jones group in, in Sheffield, England. And they showed clinically, and I'm telling you, nandrolone is the first natural derivative of testosterone. You can't, the, the measurement for it is very difficult, except for the, you know, the, the International Olympic Committee, but nandrolone is a natural hormone. It is probably 20 times more androgenic than testosterone. So in the study uh, by Hobbs, he shows that, and I'll show you the picture, that if you have nandrolone, it's pushing sugar into the muscle. 85% of your sugar stores are in the muscle, only 15% are in the abdomen with insulin. So when I add testosterone and preferably nandrolone, uh, we reduce blood sugars, I'll show you on an insulin dependent diabetic, by 100 points every month, just add one more anabolic. So nandrolone to me is more important than anything except a mandrolone in a man without testosterone can interfere with the sex performance. Mandrolone in a female, like a bodybuilder, they crazy at sex. So next, after that, you have dihydrotestosterone, which is a problem. Uh, it's as potent as nandrolone, but is terribly acne forming. So the two derivatives of dihydrotestosterone is danacrine, which is synthetic, and stanozolol, which is a sister drug, which is 100 times more potent than danacrine. And um, back when married first wife had lupus i got hold of a guy his name is mcguire in the 1980s cleveland clinic and the title of his article was estrogen progesterone testosterone can they be used to treat autoimmune disease he held it off until he became chairman of three departments at stanford but there's a the point he's saying he connected treating autoimmune disease with an anabolic steroid and getting results and he was a top internist in the country. So the, what we're building on is the observation that you have anabolic steroids and you got inflammation, in this case lupus, if I increase the anabolic steroids, even as weak as danacrine, the inflammation goes down. So he was the first one that really, I think, connected it, and, and I changed my whole direction of medicine because of him. So I, okay, I hope I got didn't uh, get off the topic too much. But, two uh, questions from uh, what you just said, one being, in your experience, you're seeing that DHT is causing a, a, a severe increase in acne. Uh, but I do deal with a lot of guys on uh, the scrotal application of testosterone cream, which drives up DHT in itself, mm -hmm. and they're not necessarily all getting acne. So that one I found a little curious. And the second question I had was in regards to nandrolone. When you are using nandrolone in a patient for this type of, of, of application, what, what type of dose are we talking about? Are we talking like tiny little amounts or higher amounts or so if you can just maybe answer those two yeah, so questions with a man i start with we'll say 200 milligrams of testosterone and they rarely have issues one of the um, more aggressive um, 30 year olds with um crohn's pushed it up to 800 milligrams and then he had terrible acne but we we actually shortened his stricture in his colon so 200 milligrams of testosterone mandrolone for a male 50 milligrams a week to me is a good dose people who are quote looking normal like you or what i used to maybe only 20. the article i have at usdoctor.com usdoctor.com under endometriosis i showed that we were able to take uh, a woman who was at john hopkins and already had part of her colon removed she was on a morphine drip and by going ahead and measuring we were able to put her on 20 mil just 20 milligrams of nandrolone twice a week 
and 10 milligrams of injectable stenazolol. She went from being a hospital patient to being one of the thousand leading realtors, and she's been treated that way without any complaints, except when she forgets her drugs, for 10 years. And the thing about anabolic steroids that really blows the water off the um, drug companies is you don't develop resistance to your natural hormones. Right. And yes, I looked at Danacrin because it is a derivative of DHT. And I looked at stenazolol because it's related. And stenazolol is like 100 times more potent than Danacrin without the uh, acne forms. And we found no one got resistance to those two drugs. So they slide through as natural. Although, yes, they are synthetic. And, so the 50 and, milligrams of nandrol, you're talking about a, a, a patient with severe issues, that's all that would really be required to treat them. For something on a more uh, preventative, if you want to call it that, for a typical healthy male, a measly 20 milligrams is all you need. So it's really that potent as a, as a compound. Yeah, but the thing that, because I've been focusing on SHBG since 1985, our environment is so xenoestrogenic, and that xenoestrogens are the stimulation for growth of liver production of sex hormone binding globin. And more and more you find that this SHBG is even down at all the cellular level. So when I treat someone, I look at the formula for bioavailable testosterone, which says total test divided by SHBG, and I use nandrolone for a female or nandrolone test to raise the testosterone, total testosterone. But I always add small doses of stenazolol uh, as a way of keeping the SHBG down, because even under normal circumstances, it's going to double in probably 20 years. And now I'm seeing kids coming in in their early 20s who have levels that we would have normally seen in the 60s. So, so let SHBG, me ask you this question. It's just as important or more important than test. Okay. So my understanding of SHBG is that it can be driven. Um, it can be driven down in the presence of an underlying condition and that low SHBG can be an indicator that there's a potentially underlying condition is the way I always understood it or the way I was always told. Now, what you're telling me is that you're seeing patients with high levels of SHBG mm -hmm. having potentially an underlying condition, but perhaps being driven by uh, environmental factors, such as you're talking about xenoestrogens and phytoestrogens. So you are purposely driving down the binding protein. Exactly. So I was always told that you don't necessarily want to lower or manually manipulate SHVG to lower it. Um, the only time that that could really be the case is if the person has very high levels of SHVG resulting in very low free testosterone. You might need a, a larger dose of testosterone to help drive down SHVG to, to free up more free testosterone. But in this case, you're referring to treating, treating disease, treating inflammation. And you're trying to get that binding protein down. So are you, when you're saying you're bringing it down, down to what point? Like, are we talking? It was when I was healthy in Superman, uh, and then, you know, whatever I put myself on for 30, 35 years did a great job. Um, I mean, I almost looked like a, I was swimming like two years ago. When I'm 75 now, but my, my photos look pretty good. And the young ladies that were dating look pretty good too. But I was fortunate that my SHBG is six. The normal level six. is six, six nanomoles per liter. Six to 15 is a range that Anderson put out in 1972. I have men that walk in with an SHBG of 120, and they've had 10 coronary stents. All right, you got the difference? So for me, the SHBG, and Anderson says that in his second article in 74, he felt SHBG was more important than testosterone. Because 98% of testosterone is going to be tied up with SHBG. Right. Okay. So when I add nandrolone, only 5% is bound. So the nandrolone is free anabolics. Okay. And just as a body's response, uh, the body could respond, even if it's making testosterone. Part of the testosterone becomes estrogen. The environment's estrogen. And what, I mean, it's a cost of $3 a week. To take 25 milligrams of a stenazolol capsule. And from a liver standpoint, by suppressing production of SHBG, you magnify the benefit of the antibiotic steroid and 
now that we're doing work in the cell itself, SHBG is everywhere. It's on the cell wall. It's on the receptors and uh, the hormone receptors. So high levels of SHBG, to me, is inflammatory. Okay, high estrogen, high SHBG is inflammatory. The only medical condition we see with low SHBG would be polycystic ovary disease. And if, now, are you when you're saying work, estrogens, are you referring specifically to um, environmental estrogens, or are you also yes. referring to uh, estradiol, as shown estradiol made in the body? Yeah, I mean, birth control pills are xenoestrogen, no question about it. And what he showed 40, 50 years ago, one microgram of ethanyl estradiol, which is one twentieth of a birth control pill will lower a man's bioavailable testosterone by 40%. Wow. One twentieth of a birth control pill. Okay, so we're talking strictly synthetic estrogens here. Right. And the okay, bottom we're not line talking, is... Uh, we're not talking bioidentical estradiol and the, no, the, the ones say, that the body makes. We're talking about external estradiol and the birth control pill. So okay. the way I look at it is I want as much free testosterone. I want as many soldiers as I can muster. And anybody who's going to tie them up I want to get rid of them because the if you have the nandrolone, which is three times stronger than testosterone at fit, fitting the receptor, if I fit all these estrogen, androgen, um, testosterone receptors with good anabolic steroids, which is nandrolone and test, my body's going to function beautifully. And the biggest problem is the SHBG ties up your test, your test levels are dropping, xenoestrogens come in to fill those receptors. And that's how you're self-poisoned. So if you were to just, I'm, I'm just trying to play devil's advocate here. If you wouldn't necessarily drive SHBG down, but instead you would raise testosterone levels further, which would then raise free testosterone levels further, would the outcome not be the same? The SHBG comes up. Your body knows what ratio it's going to want. And this has been in the literature. You know, people, you know, bodybuilders out there have been writing this. I, I remember seeing this. 30 years ago, he says, why is it when I'm taking more testosterone, I don't feel better and my SHBG goes up? Up. And the I was told that, I was told I was, that an, an exogenous estrogens will drive it down. Estrogens drive SHBG. In other words, an example, OBGYN, woman's pregnant. Estriol is a terribly weak estrogen, but it will triple knock it will increase the levels of SHBG by tenfold or more to protect the baby against a virilizing tumor. So the idea of SHBG is to keep testosterone down. Okay. It, it, and the driving of, of up of, S, of SHBG with that from estradiol is that is, is that are we talking strictly for women or does that the same mechanism of action of, in men? Because I learned it a completely it, no, different well, way. It, I see in I see it in both. I mean, I think it's a biological function. So the thing, the last thing, when someone comes in that's really sick, um, I mean, we talk about my Crohn's patients forever, but guy comes in, he's got uh, a bio T ratio, bioavailable testosterone. We'll say 100 percent is normal. He comes in with a 30 percent. He may have a testosterone of four or 500, but he'll have a sex hormone binding of 60. I want to see that 60 down under 20, okay? And then his testosterone is 600. Suddenly, and that's really, depending what you do, if you're doing 200 milligrams of testosterone, I would say 60, 800 would be the normal numbers at a week. I'm not, re I'm not increasing his test. I'm getting rid of the binding protein to free the testosterone and the nandrolone to be usable. When you're like, saying six to 800, are we talking serum levels or are we talking a weekly dose? Ser serum levels, uh, nanograms per deciliter okay. uh, for testosterone, I think are good levels. Okay. Um, but it, it, being honest with you, if someone comes in and I just had a new patient with mild Crohn's, his 600 is where his test is, his binding protein is in the thirties. So I'm going to treat him to maintain his testosterone, but I'm gonna get that 30 binding protein down under 10. Now I've tripled his bioavailable testosterone and his symptoms often will go away. Okay. So, so I've seen guys in that range, where as you said, their SHG was a little higher. 
Um, they would take, and some, sometimes it was in guys in Europe, they would take things like Proviron, uh, or even sometimes like Oxandrolone in the US, which would drive the binding protein down, free up more free testosterone, they'd feel better. But I have seen lots of guys in the 800, even 900 range with nearly single digit, or oftentimes even single digit SHBG, uh, not experiencing symptom resolution and had to bring their, their levels up considerably higher until they were. Uh, until they did have symptom resolution. So is that... The, thing that, you know, the thing that I do, because you know, if I have three good drugs, I use them. Remember, a little bit of nandrolone is like um, you know, 100 times testosterone. So when I'm giving 20, just 20 milligrams of nandrolone, it's as androgenic as 200 of tests. So small amounts of nandrolone is where I fit into that. I don't look to push the testosterone higher. In the beginning, I got when I went on test, I had two breast cysts from conversion to estrogen. But by adding a drug that blocks the estrogen, the SHBG, and small amounts of nandrolone, um, without being an exercise guru, I mean, I had everything working well. And uh, God willing, you know, my brain's working. I'm writing. We have four papers coming out this year at 75. Uh, I can't help what the body's doing, but. Uh, it worked very well, and just I think the nandrolone addition is more important than pushing the test. Okay, got it. Could you get so some from the more um, the uh, diabetes you were bringing up earlier, driving down the diabetes, the blood sugars, uh, it's a mod modulating insulin. How are you yeah. using the anabolics for that? So I, I presented this at the A four M in ninety nine. Three people listened to me, and. Um, continued and told me it would work. So I take a patient who's a diabetic, whether they're on insulin, I have three patients who had 18s, which is as high as it goes for an A1C. And what I'd say is, let's do a glucose tolerance test on you to start. So top picture, if I can focus it, the numbers are off. But basically, if you see the top line, that's yeah. a glucose tolerance test with someone with not taking insulin who's diabetic. Then I give them the testosterone, whether you want to use implants or 200 milligrams a week. And then you see the second line is lower. That's actually the green line. That's how much the drop has been just by using 200 milligrams of testosterone, no insulin. Then the third line is nandrolone. Fourth line, um, we tried oxandrolone, didn't make a difference. He dropped his blood sugar at two hours from two from two ninety five excuse me three ninety five to one hundred and seventy five drop of one hundred and fifty points, which you saw was purely because of adding the anabolic steroids. Now, what's wow. more interesting, I think, if you look down here, and anybody wants this. Um, I have a telephone number I hope works. It's 1-877-OXYTOCIN. Yeah, Danny thought that was funny. But uh, if you look here, here's his insulin level. And because he's an adult onset, 62-year-old um, African-American man who actually had 300 trophies from WWF. So he works out like crazy. So here he has an insulin level that goes to 21 during this insulin oral glucose tolerance test. And then we add testosterone, nandrolone, and stenazolol. And at the bottom here, wherever my finger is supposed to be, his fasting insulin is 11. We reduced him from a fasting insulin of 21, which is bad, to 11, which actually is normal. And he did not take any insulin. This is the effect that we talked about, which is called non insulin facilitated transport. It is not insulin that puts glucose into your muscle, it's testosterone and androlone. So by treating everybody with the insulin drugs, all you're doing is affecting their abdominal girth, and his hemoglobin was 16, and now he sits around 6.6 .6 without insulin. I've had- So the anabolics are replacing the insulin. 18, I'm sorry. As high the as anabolics 18. are replacing insulin, sorry. There's a little, there's a slight delay when we're talking on the audio, so sorry if I cut you off. I'm sorry. I've had two patients that were at 18, and with only insulin, without insulin, they came down to six just by adding this. And of course, they drop weight like crazy. 
you can use this with insulin, but explain that when you add testosterone to a patient on insulin, within 24 hours, their insulin requirements will drop by 50%. But they do not Samoji because while insulin only pushes sugar into the cell, the nanolone testosterone will also let it come out. So I had one, this, this fellow actually put, took 100 units of insulin the first time he had insulin. 100 units, and he never crashed. So testosterone for a male diabetic is more important than insulin. And anybody wants this, just, you know, call, call me, I'll mail it out to you. one oxytocin is hopefully a new phone line. The point I'm making, this has been in the literature. The studies were done in Sheffield, England. And um, you may find it funny. I have a, I talked to, I got one endocrinologist to listen to me from Wayne State. He came out and looked at my data, and he let me send Ernie down to him, and he called me back and he said, I can't include Ernie in my study. It screws up the data so badly. The, um, we were talking a little bit offline about uh, – why you have that 1-800-oxytocin. Um, you wanna, if you want to touch on that. Yeah, I mean, um, people ask me, do I ever rest? And I say, I don't know. Whatever I wake up with, I use. But a new area of research for me has been oxytocin. Now, gynecologists, of course, obstetricians know that we use it to induce labor. But back in my day, they actually tried to use it as a nasal spray from milk letdown, and it didn't work. Anyway. Um, I stumbled upon that some of these anabolic steroids actually can be applied topically. And actually, it was my uh, stepson, he, who was 21, had an SHBG of 54. And his mother cooked everything natural. And so she, while writing the last book we put out, um, she knew about this and, you know, test all the kids. So here he has his very high SHBG, skinny, tall kid. So I gave him one of our shots, and he had a roid rage. He's standing above me, 6'3", he said, what do you think you're going to do, Dad, right? So I turned to him and I said, I'm not your dad right now. I'm your drug dealer. And he dropped to his knees and said, I went up 10 pounds on my curls in one week. Don't, Dad, don't. <laughs> so I made it into a cream. And what happened was, um, and it's a different combination of the ones we're doing. So he's sitting there with his 5'11", girlfriend, very shy, and things weren't going along fast enough, so he saw Dad's tube of cream, okay? So he greased the wheel, or whatever else you want to say he greased, and he went in and got over and got done. He rolls over, and Nikki says, you're not done. And later he tells me, I've been with Nikki for, you know, two and a half years. We never did it more than once. So being macho man, you know, twice he said, you go to sleep. Third time, Nikki took her nails put him in his back and clawed him and said, if I tell you to come back, you better come back. So being 22, of course, no problem doing that. And he says, well, Dad always said, if something happens that doesn't seem to fit, we should test it more. I mean, he's a pretty boy. He could go ahead. If a girl said no, he could turn to the one next to him and come follow me. So he said he had two other girls over uh, during the week, and they both said, anytime you want to use the cream, we'll come back. And this just, it happened just a few months before my wife passed. But I told my patients, and two out of three couples came back saying, this is the best stuff ever. And one of the other colleagues who specialized in frigidity, I gave him the product, and he said, I worked with this woman for 10 years. I got her one second orgasm, and your cream gave her multiples. But he went ahead and using his wife as a cool guinea pig, he measured blood levels of oxytocin, before you start, and then when she, she orgasmed, which we'll say was actually normally 15 minutes, now dropped to 10 minutes on the cream, and then 20 minutes later. And the levels of oxytocin were producing, it's like I'm throwing a light switch right into the amygdala. This is central oxytocin, were 50% higher than what it was normally, and it stayed that way for an hour. Now, what I think is the funny part, he wouldn't tell me this. Two years later, he told me, I didn't want to tell you, but after I drew her blood on the oxytocin producing cream, he said, she made me come back and take care of her, and they're both in their 60s. So 
I found it funny, and you know, I won't tell you my personal stories, but um, <laughs> get, 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 so this is this is a worse. But this, this cream is a cream is that's available. applied hmm? vaginally. I'm assuming. Actually, it follows the nerve paths. It works just as well on the nipples as well as the clitoris. So one of the studies I want to do, if there's any OBGYNs out there, is get the mothers whose babies are in the NICU and have them apply the cream while you're pumping. You're not feeding the baby. Uh, you could go ahead and measure volumes of blood with or without the cream. Um, I believe that the clitoris and nipple are probably equal as two branches of the Y going up through the spinal phlegmic tract, and we could show how much more milk is produced. And um, my stepdaughter, while she was nursing, told me when she applied the cream, she thought she had opened a faucet. That was how much dramatic. And we don't have a medical product that works to induce milk, but this does. So and this isn't in central oxytocin itself in the cream, correct? You're t you're no, but I, it's in the patent. So you want to look it up. I, it's actually stenazolol. So the stenazolol is boosting oxytocin uh, stenazolol within the brain. Trigger, I believe it's triggering testosterone release in the synapses. And then the brain responds at this end by producing um, oxytocin, and the levels can be measured with blood or saliva. But for mothers that don't can't nurse, I mean, La Leche's out of business tomorrow. But the other part about this is the same concept. The woman is not nursing, okay, and the cream releases tremendous amounts of oxytocin that um, – her interest in sex increases. Of course, if she doesn't want you, she's not going to do it. But uh, I've had many cases of women I had barely been introduced to who had no nothing between high and bang, bang. So, I mean, to me, I've been unbelievable responses, so much so that men, when we sell it, we have to put a warning on it. We cannot sell it to men. I don't want to be accused of... of date rape okay but so we're only selling the products to women and if the oh, website awesome. will be up at that 1877 oxytocin probably within the month uh if it's a physician at the other end of course i'll make exception but to me i a guy couldn't get a date in high school you know ain't no problem anymore <laughs> the wheelchair is a big problem but i'm saying it's really been really interesting i've saved marriages for marriage counseling you build up a resistance to uh, your partner psychological, whatever, you know, you, once you blow past that, um, most of my patients who told me in their 60s were having sex almost every day. And wow. um, I have a woman 80, you like this, a doctor in her 80s, came back and said, Ed, got to stop using the cream. I think I'm going to kill my husband. He's 84 and I want it twice a day. So uh, I think it's, uh, to me, it's uh, hilarious. On the other hand, I'm treating Crohn's. And heart failure patients at the universities are rejecting. If I go down in history, he's the guy that came up with what we call honeymoon or love cream. So I thought that would be an interesting the side. Cream. The concept here we're trying to work, if I could keep the oxytocin levels higher, I think there's a place for its use in autism. And the other thing about these oxytocin lozenges anybody can get, uh, I have a number of people who had trouble with addiction with nicotine. And for some reason, the oxytocin, just oral lozenges, and one guy who's been on this for three months hasn't smoked. So I don't know what oxytocin is, but we know it's the first hormone that God created in us. Every other hormone has to work with it. But no one to date has any done anything that's consistent. And nasal oxytocin is not going to be absorbed. If you want to think of the process, uh, deep in your brain is the amygdala, which is where we're where the cream is working, but then it goes to the pituitary stalk and the oxytocin that's used for um, milk letdown and for uterine contractions is actually at the bottom of the stalk. So when people think they're getting oxytocin in by spraying up their nose, they're probably not getting 2% of what I can do. And, the, you know, you look up the patent, no secrets, excuse me. I vary it between 2 and 10%. I try some 30%. It makes no difference, um, but depending on what pharmacy you use, uh, and I've tested half a dozen pharmacies, 
depending on what they mix the cream in makes a real big difference between whether it's well absorbed or not. And are there any issues keeping oxytocin kind of chronically high over the long term? Like, is it? I, I don't know how to do it. I mean, you, you go ahead and um, some of the studies we're going to do now with the women uh, to, just to get what normal blood levels are is to follow it out more than 60 minutes. And again, this was women only. So the autistic boy I tried to use it with, it didn't do anything. Now, if it was an autistic woman, girl, and we could get the oxytocin levels up, and we can within five minutes. So if an autistic female is having a bad episode, you rub it on her chest, and with six, seven, eight years old, and maybe in five minutes, they'll settle down. I don't know, but that's okay. where I'm looking. And then, you know, could we keep it up? Some biochemical company will probably have to figure out how to modify the stenazolol molecule so that it continues to trigger that in the brain. But on the other hand, you know, when we, we want a cream that has a woman orgasming for three hours, I don't know. That's a little long. Um, no, I, my question was more in regards to someone who decides uh, I, I'm going to apply the cream every night every night before bed and have some wild sex and go to sleep and rinse and repeat over days, weeks, months, years. Could there be a point in time where constantly spiking oxytocin that high could cause some kind of adverse reaction? Oh, if you look at the women who are hypersexed and want to have sex time six times a day, um, they're doing fine. Uh, just like all the other hormones we've talked about, if you're using a natural hormone, it's good. Now, the person wants to abuse it, okay, you know, can't make a difference. But um, um, when you hit the right number, right time, um, I had one partner with that basically had orgasms for about 20 minutes and didn't move for 12 hours afterwards. So it just depends on the individual. Oh, she was 27. Don't worry about it. But the <laughs> bottom line is, is uh, no, I have women in their 60s and 70s and, and 80s who, are enjoying sex. And then there's others that don't. But again, to what set the precedent, if you want a woman to respond and they're going to be afraid about testosterone, small dose nandrolone does not cause facial hair. And nandrolone in women in their 50s, um, 40s, 50s, they're very happy. Um, it's just trouble in Canada. You got a government that, um, you know, is stupid. And if I ever get big enough for someone with enough money to get me to talk to your um, board, whoever this premier in Ontario, I'll say, let me eliminate your Hermira drop. I'll give you $3 billion back tomorrow, and we're going to have more than 10 patients in Canada in our publications. So if you want to get off the drugs, stop spending the money. you got 75 treatment centers. Let's just go to the treatment center for your man in stands. But uh, you should put a statue up to Ben Johnson. Because he was smarter than all the doctors. Yeah. yeah. But I you know how it works person. here. And I mean, in the U.S., it's, it's the Everywhere same. Else. It's but not no longer person. medical and it's no longer the science. It's politics. Everything well, is driven said, by politics. You know, with, the, with the laboratory testing we have in Toronto, if the government wanted to, because I told you it was a $6 trillion fuck up from day one, a high school student would have known that you can't get immunity with this COVID. But if they wanted to find an answer, we have a diagnostic technique now. So if a patient's out there or doctor's out there and says, I have no idea what's wrong with this patient, it's worth $2,500 to see what we could possibly treat the patient with. So in the future, you know, you could walk in and say, I'm here for my six-month checkup, doc. Is there any changes in my cytokines? And blood test comes back that they're perfect. Fine. Yeah. But that means also, as you just take an alphabetical order. Asthma, autoimmune, we have finding results with immunity with breast cancer, which to me is absolutely crazy. Crohn's, diabetes, endometriosis, fibromyalgia, heart disease, GI disease like celiac and SIBO, inflammation, lupus, juvenile arthritis, looking at how this can apply to neurological diseases, including multiple sclerosis, which I believe we can make a difference with. Uh, Parkinson's and um, um, Alzheimer's actually show that testosterone is toxic. So here's a case where the disease, the Parkinson, you would never use testosterone with. 
male or female. Testosterone so is toxic strictly in Parkinson's patients? If you look at Parkinson's and testosterone, they'll report that the ones who have the highest testosterone levels have the most disease. Okay, so you got a reversal. You would expect the testosterone would help them, you know, maintain their, you know, mental function and everything else. But there's a testosterone negativity with that. Um, and I can't explain why. The other well, thing and we're, again, we're, this, we're talking strictly in Parkinson's patients, right? In non-Parkinson's Parkinson's patients, this is, that's not, a, that's not the, the issue. Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, our testing shows testosterone has negative effects. If you also, if you measure um, the cytokines, you'll see tumor necrosis factor is elevated in Alzheimer's and, Mark, and uh, Parkinson's. So there is a hormonal factor that we may not have the answer for, but we know there's a cytokine factor specifically worse in these neurological cases. So if you, if you really, if you want to say what's really happening, you need this test. I mean, it's expensive. The cost of it is 2500 and there's no profit. But if you say, I've had all the drugs for Crohn's disease, they come to me, and of course Crohn's and Colitis Foundation is going to let me talk at the next meeting, right? So, but we showed that if you took that patient on Humira, got some initial response, but if you added our drug with it, the patient could stay on the drug or lower dose of the drug longer. But I have patients 10 years, the one that had his whole bottle cut out, he's 10 years now since I've treated him, and he's back at work. So we're adding another modality to treat inflammation, and we don't care. I don't care what the disease is. Uh, example, venous thrombosis. Anybody wants to look this up, there's an article by Menon, M-E-N-O-N, first initial I, British Medical Journal, 1971. Stenazolol plus metformin is as good as streptokinase for dissolving blood clots, and I've used it over the years. So here you have a drug that costs nothing, and it's more effective, and you know people don't send you home with streptokinase, but I'm saying, I do it all the time. With people at PE. So if you look at how much these anabolic steroids do for you, it's ubiquitous. And we can test it in the test tubes and be able to confirm. And someone with diabetes says, well, one of, one of my colleagues, our colleagues in New York, um, I won't mention the name, but he listened to me. So he said, oh, I can do that. Right. So he started writing for testosterone for diabetes and the board pulled him in. What are you doing? So he calls me, and I knew what he was doing, and I sent him a copy of the book we put out on Amazon 15 years ago, and I wrote a letter and a couple examples of patients, and they let him go. So if you're out there and you're worried about the FDA, DEA, Michigan Board, I mean, I have eight different organizations who have gone after me, you know, knowledge is power. And when they come down and want to talk to me, you know, that's why I have patents on these products. So the DEA may have to find something. Oh, you mix the syringe for your patient. That'll cost you forty grand. But the medicine there will hold up in the courts. Okay, it's not like the Blue Cross, which you know, play games forever. But if you have the knowledge base we put together, you should feel safe. And if not, they won't argue with me because I said I've, I've beaten eight of them with knowledge. So everyone's too afraid to write for anabolic steroids. If you have a question in, up front, you know, write me a letter. I write your response, and I've got documentation. But for those who are diabetes, find this article by Hobbs, 1999, uh, non-insulin, NIFT, non-insulin facility transport. It shows 85% of sugar is moved into the muscle because of nandrolone and test. So all the advertising for diabetic drugs and all the toxicity of them is another mismanagement. I can't think of any disease where man-made drug actually will outperform a natural drug. Mm. It's after Funny you how that works. Works. know how to apply it. Um, Ed, how would, if anyone wants to reach you, what are the different methods of them reaching you? Yeah, so the, the routinely, uh, like I said, this number, she just called me back, says working. 1-877-Oxytocin. And I, it makes you smile, makes me smile. And I was going to put one eight seven seven, Doctor Love. I was thinking to put one eight seven seven. 
honeymoon queen. But the point being is that will get into my answering service and then I'll get a message. The website awesome. that's still up is US Doctor, US D O C T O R dot info. And a duplicate site is at dot com. Um, I'm going to try move the oxytocin and the info into the same place. And the way I'm setting this up is uh, going through an operator, which is a person, uh, a woman can order the drug. But I have a second part of the program that if someone wants to work with me, recognizes I have a patent, okay, then I can actually put them in the system so the prescription comes out with their name on it. And then I have the facilities that will fill it based on my experience of what works and what doesn't work. Um, so the, the male doctors get hold of me. We bypass the piss, bypass that, you know, no men allowed uh, part of this. And in time, awesome. um, if this group grows, the not the steroids you're talking about, testosterone, nandrolone, stands, um, uh, Danacrin, uh, I'm more than willing to anybody ask questions. And there's no charge. Um, what would I do with this person? Okay, or will help if you, if I have to help manage it, it. It's a little bit time consuming. You know, like you said, you know, I have this gown beret. I'm in a wheelchair. Trust me, I'm almost slipped off the bed. It's it's um, I'm I've been functioning this way for over a year. I just hope to be able to function. But uh, uh, the knowledge is out there, and anybody who wants it or wants to work on a research project, if you've got the patience, um, I have people that will write IRBs. And like I said, we have endometriosis up and running, Crohn's I want to run. I can't find cardiologists who want to find out that actually the anabolic steroids, I've taken patients rejected by heart transplant by U of M, ejection fractions under 15%, and I've got them back for a normal life for 10 years. Okay. Okay. So anyone watching, if you've got any of the diseases and stuff that uh, Dr. Lichten was mentioning, uh, you can always mention to your doctor to potentially reach out. I'm going to have all the contact information listed in the video. Uh, Ed, thank you very much for your time. This is a really it interesting It worked out talk. perfectly. I just got the notice that your battery is running low. I've out-talked the battery. So um, <laughs> thank you, Danny. And uh, you never know. You call me a couple of weeks. I may have a couple more things. But uh, think about the breast cancer one. This is going to blow a lot of oncologists out of the water. I won't tell you how nice they were at to me when I presented it to Carmanos downtown, but I should have been wearing a bulletproof vest. <laughs> and by the way, breast cancer, the drugs they use, and astrazole and tamoxifen, if you look up the studies, stanazolol and nandrolone outperformed them in German double-blind studies in the 1990s. So all the drugs being used by the Hemoncologists for breast cancer are not effective. I like that. Another and these reason drugs not to are use an AI. improving the pro inflammatory cytokines on breast cancer patients. Wouldn't you want to? I mean, nandrolone will dry, dry up a uterus. That's why we use it for endometriosis. Imagine doing that for breast cancer. Wouldn't you think mm -hmm. fibrosis, keeping the cancers tied up, dried up tissue would be good? They didn't look at it that way. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, Danny. And um, like I said, I'm here. As long as I'm here, I got information to share. Okay, guys? Awesome. Thank you very Thank much, you. Ed.